Hello. Welcome to Research Evaluation and Evidence Generation in Population Health. This is Lecture B. We are going to focus on literature reviews in this lecture. The learning objective for this lecture is to identify relevant literature and studies to inform proposed interventions. Some of the tools and strategies that are used in a literature review will be included. We will talk about the different types of literature reviews and how to conduct them. You will be introduced to some tools, including Google Scholar, the Social Sciences Citation Index, or SSCI, and PubMed. We'll also discuss an example related to Health Information National Trends Survey. What is, quote, the literature, end quote, that you're actually looking at? This can include a wide array of sources, including websites, etc. The gold standard in many literature reviews being conducted for academic purposes is the peer-reviewed scholarly article. These articles come out of journals where you have editors, referees, and they're generally what we call double-blinded. In other words, the reviewers and the authors do not know who one another are. This is particularly valuable because it increases the reliability and hopefully the validity of those sources. Books, conference proceedings, dissertations from doctoral students, and patents are also fair game. You just have to determine the scope and purpose of your literature review. A literature review is an analytic summary of the literature as it exists, hopefully up to today. There's also the question of how far back in time do you go? If you're doing just a literature review of a management concept, for example, there have been several comprehensive literature reviews done over different intervals. One strategy is to only go back to the most recent one of those and bring it up to date. You may also want to compare or relate different theories or findings. There's a big movement afoot right now to replicate research particularly in psychology, and to a lesser extent in medicine, although it's growing there as well. And a lot of times, what we're trying to do is see if we can recreate the findings of those earlier studies. You should have a theme around which to organize your review. This will help you narrow the topic much more quickly. Not all literature reviews need to be exhausted by any means. In many instances, if you're writing a paper, you may just want to find support for a particular number or statement. One type of literature review is for standalone content. If you are trying to compare theories, you may want to go back to the two people who originated the theories that you're comparing, and then work your way forward on the research that they've worked on since then. And then say which theory you prefer. Can you find evidence supporting the interpretation of one over the other? This is an important element for comparing and contrasting within a literature review. Most well-done literature reviews will try to have some fidelity around comparing different perspectives so that you're not always just promoting your own perspective. This type of review is often done when you're preparing an article for publication on a particular topic. The Research Proposal so many of us write grants and contracts and other elements where we're actually searching for funding or trying to get other people to support or take interest in our research. To that end, we'll want to find articles or pieces of literature that support the questions that we're asking and tell why they're important. You can also use them to demonstrate how you're going to replicate or bring up to date somebody else's research and how it's contributed to the field. It can often prove useful if you perform a literature review to find research from the agency where you're searching for funds or from the authors on the committee that you hope will fund you. For example, the Commonwealth Fund or Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Using the research that they've put out to support the funding or your research will be a smart strategy. Using the research that they've put out to support the funding of your research would be a smart strategy. And lastly is the comprehensive literature review. 
There are some faculty who, more or less, do this for a living and will often have several literature reviews on their CVs. On occasion, they'll do this in conjunction with a doctoral seminar where they have dozens of students who they can employ to go out and actually search for articles, abstract those articles, and make sure they actually fit into the topic. Many journals have special review issues where they'll actually ask, once a year, that faculty review a topic or two. Review articles tend to be very highly cited, which is why you'll see academics in particular write them intermittently to add to their CVs. There's also replication and extension research, where the aim is to reproduce the findings from an earlier study. To do that, you may need to have a comprehensive literature review, looking at all the work that is relied on that original piece of research. Let's now turn to some basics of conducting a literature review. Most important is to make sure that the method you're using truly matches your purpose. The smallest purpose, where you're just trying to make a point, requires you to find that one article that supports your information or your assertion. You may want to actually have two or three citations on any given point. There's a particular instance in any documented work where you will absolutely have to have a citation. When you're making a numerical reference, for example, if you want to say the United States healthcare industry consumes 17% of the gross domestic product, you need to cite it. Anytime you see a statistical reference that isn't of your own empirical analysis, you need to document it. The other purpose you may have for a literature review is identifying a broad body of work. One of the most common books on bookshelves around the School of Public Health is called To Air is Human. And you'll see many articles dealing with patient safety and the quality of health care start with a reference to this very particular text. Another example from the business field is something called the resource-based view of the firm. And depending on who you listen to, there are two gentlemen, Werner Felt and Jay Barney, who are generally credited with developing this idea. And they have slightly different flavors, but as you can see, Werner Felt really has the first article out that's clearly identified dealing with this topic in 1984. Jay Barney came along in 1991 and really tied it more closely to sustained competitive advantage. And most of the articles I see citing the resource-based view rely heavily on Barney. You'll also notice that some articles are updated with literature reviews on a fairly regular basis. The Journal of Management, which routinely puts out review issues, does this about every decade to keep up with the resource-based view, particularly given its ongoing importance in the management and strategy research. The third reason you may want to conduct a literature review is when you're actually doing a full-blown literature review and want to be as comprehensive as possible. It's often done in conjunction with a dissertation. For example, the comprehensive literature review could be a chapter in your dissertation. There are some best standards for this, including the Cochrane-based system of review. You can go to their website to learn about this. Another recommendation, if you're trying to do a broad literature review, is to ask a librarian. Many institutions have very fine library resources that are generally underutilized. These are the experts who can really help you. Another type of literature review, which we will briefly mention, is the meta-analysis. There are entire courses dedicated to conducting meta-analyses and their various forms. This is where you're generally trying to combine the statistics from prior analyses to reach a new and larger conclusion, or to determine the generalizability of those findings. Almost all searches start with keywords. Basic keywords are the ones that we just dream up on our own, or, quote, best guess searches, end quote. These are natural language searches and are a good way to start thanks to modern search capabilities. Previously, the first step would have been to open the medical subject setting book to find the headings that most closely match the ideas we were trying to research. You should keep very good documentation around your search 
documenting all the keywords that you've searched, keeping some annotation on how well they performed, whether you're going to use them again, and whether they're going to form the corpus of your structured review. You may want to discard or delimit some terms that bring in ideas that you really don't want to include. From the very beginning, keep notes on your searches. Google does this quite well in its Google Scholar application. To a lesser extent, the Social Science Citation Index does this. PubMed does it as well, although it is truly driven by MeSH headings. Let's talk about medical subject headings, MeSH. NIH's Library of Medicine website has tools for you to actually explore MeSH headings. You can do some natural language searches to help find the MeSH heading that best suits your purposes. Here's an example where the term electronic health record was searched. You can see that some other key terms, such as electronic medical records, also come up. In addition, it's suggested you look at the results for medical record linkage. One important thing to note is how the branching works. The highest order of MeSH heading is investigative techniques, followed by epidemiological methods. Now, as somebody who largely studies health administration, I would not have told you that electronic health records belongs under epidemiological methods as its main branching method. But this is good to know. So if I go out and start searching for electronic health records or electronic medical records, I know where some of these topics are likely to go. I can even go up a level of extraction and just go to medical record systems, which is not the common vernacular at all and not something I probably would have put in as a natural language processing. When I go to PubMed or other search tools, I may want to use these terms because every article that they've put into PubMed will be cataloged using these terms. So this is important to know. This example of what a good search strategy write-up comes from an open source article by Black et al. Quote, the impact of e-health on the quality of safety and healthcare, a systematic review, end quote, available through PLOS Medicine. The article recommends using the Cochrane-based systematic review principles. Go into the internet and find the Cochrane Center and look at that. They relied on MeSH as well as free terms. And you'll notice that they put in parentheses text S1. They've provided a table of the free terms that they used as well as those that they discarded as they did their open search. They used PubMed, Medline, Embase, and the Cochrane Library. They also mentioned somewhere down in here that they did Google Scholar. I recommend that you start with Google Scholar. This flowchart presents how the search played out. They drew in almost 8,000 articles from the Cochrane Library. Medline contributed another 10,596, Embase 26,153, then their personal database. This indicates to me that they're probably using a tool like EndNote to organize and keep their library. I recommend you do the same. This also will help you build your references for your dissertation and keep them in the right places. It allows you to change the format of references from, say, APA, to a Harvard numbered system, depending on what the journal or your institution demand. Having a personal database is not a bad thing. They identified in total 46,000 plus articles. You'll notice very quickly that when they looked at the duplication, the vast majority of these were duplicates, 44,000 and change. Once they got rid of all that, they were down to 1,772 articles. When they went and looked at what articles actually dealt very closely with their topic, they got rid of 1,716, which means they only were left with 56 articles to fully analyze based on their initial review. They then went and redid the entire process with the updated searches and found another 52 articles. They ended up with 108 overall as part of their systematic review. However, as a reader of this article, this really helped me understand what they did. 
They also provide tables online of all 108 articles, their abstracts, and main findings. That's really best practice and the sort of extra documentation that's likely to keep your research well cited and well understood. Let's take a look at some tools for conducting literature reviews. The first tool is Google Scholar. I've already conducted a search on a topic I mentioned earlier, the resource-based view of the firm. You'll notice that it pulls up a couple of the articles that I've already mentioned, such as the Werner Feld article. This particular search has been done by relevance, which is the number of times that the article has been cited. This is important to know. Different search engines have different criteria for citation. There are a few other nice things that you may want to know about the Google Scholar search. It allows you to actually see all the articles that have cited the works in your search results. By the way, there may be multiple versions of the same article on many instances in there. You'll see some of the duplication. There are a few other things you should know. It's possible to do an advanced search looking for an exact phrase or just one of the keywords anywhere in the article. Sometimes it's informative to search for authors. If you know who an author is who works extensively in a field, you might look for the work that they've done to ensure that you have a comprehensive literature review. Viewing the citations that make use of a returned article allows us to start searching within them. We can narrow down a large search output very quickly this way. Maybe we want to look for something such as, quote, sustainable competitive advantage, end quote, for example, and that'll shrink the number of articles that are in that search. It's also easy to change the sort order of your results and sort by date. Getting the most recent articles might be important and is often useful. For instance, if you're trying to update statistics on things such as the gross domestic product, populations, disease burden, those sorts of things, you want to have the most recently available numbers. Another nice feature of the Google search engine is the ability to export citations to EndNote or RefWorks and some other programs. You can also set up alerts to get notified when a particular work is cited. Another search engine is PubMed, good for health services research or something in the clinical area. PubMed also has some nice features. You can actually save most of the searches. You can search by relevance or by how recently it was added, etc. You will need to learn how to use a few of these to effectively conduct a literature review. The last tool is the Web of Science. This is a Thomson Reuters product, and this is the Social Science Citation Index. You should look in the social sciences if that's where you're interested. There are a few other nice features in here. You can get journal citation reports. If you're trying to figure out where to place an article for publication, you can see which journals are performing the best in terms of how often they're cited, etc. These are nice tools that happen to be in the Web of Science website. Similar to PubMed, Web of Science also permits you to save many searches. You can also see how many times an article has been cited. You can do citation reports and analyze the results. Web of Science is also very good for letting you search backwards and forwards. That means that one can see the references that this article cites, as well as all of the articles that cited it. Google and PubMed will allow you to do very similar things. If you're trying to create a very comprehensive literature review, this is a very helpful tool. You can create the citation map that I mentioned earlier which will show you how things are moving forward and backwards, or backwards and forward. I can even go two generations so that I can see the articles that cited the original. I've given you a quick overview of online search engines for literature reviews. These tools become more and more powerful day in and day out. In particular, I believe that Google and Google Scholar will be integrated more closely with Google Docs in the near future, which will be a very powerful sharing tool. As you collaborate with your co-authors, you'll be able to use those features. You'll notice and should look into the many little buttons and ways you can refine your searches.
One example of a comprehensive literature review is for a project using Health Information National Trends Surveys, or HINTS. The purpose of HINTS is to gather data about how people use cancer-related information. The review of HINTS literature had several goals. One goal was to reproduce the results from the original articles that had been found in the search, using the same data to check their statistics. Second, the review was done in order to replicate the findings using more recent data to see if there have been changes in how people sought cancer information. And lastly, the findings would be extended to conduct new analyses, including pooling data, a time series, those sorts of things. The first step in this project was to call the librarian. Always start by calling your librarian. They're one of your best resources. Next, PubMed, Google Scholar, and the Social Science Citation Index, SSCI, were searched. Their returned references were downloaded into Excel in order to record their very specific fields. This was to determine how often some of the variables of each article had been referenced. In other words, the data was saved to determine which parts of the survey people find most valuable. Next, all the articles were pulled and coded, comparing tables. In particular, the correlation or regression tables, if they were present, were compared to the survey instrument itself. Even in the best of worlds with computer technology, a lot of times, when you're doing a literature review, you will have to take notes by hand and keep annotated elements available. After every variable was coded, their coefficients were put into the Stata statistical software, and a Stata dataset was created. This allowed the reviewers to see if an article could be reproduced over subsequent survey years. So what did the literature review reveal? There are about 266 articles identified after going through PubMed, Google Scholar, and SSCI. The National Cancer Institute actually keeps a library where they hope they've captured all the people who've used the HINTS data in empirical research. Of the 266 articles, it was determined 33 that didn't actually use the HINTS data, but instead were merely making reference to the survey. That left 233 articles. Another 201 were excluded because they used a variable that was only used in one year, making the replication part of the project more difficult. And at the end of the day, only 32 articles or studies were readily replicable out of the 266 first identified. That left us with over 200 that had been abstracted and for which questions remained. Perhaps many of the variables were just not clearly identified so it may be worth going back to those original authors and collaborating to see if we can replicate and then update their studies in the future. So that's work pending. But the comprehensive review returned 32 articles matching our focus. Let's review what we've covered in this lecture. First, we discussed how literature reviews are purpose-driven. For example, standalone content, supporting research, comprehensive. We also looked at how literature reviews require appropriate search tools, such as Google Scholar, PubMed, or Web of Science, to name a few. It is important to remember that the method must match the purpose. We discussed how search strategies include setting parameters, such as keywords, source relevance, and narrowed scope, date, document type, publisher, etc. Finally, we examined how focused reviews support proposed interventions. An example we looked at in some detail was the HINTS study.